Good morning, everyone. Oscar Ortiz here, superintendent of Heritage Classical Academy, a proposed tuition-free public charter school with plans to open in Houston, Texas. Welcome to our live stream, All Things Classical, where today we discuss K-12 American classical education. We have an exciting program prepared for you today with the hopes that you can use this information that we plan to offer you to make a difference in your own local communities. There's a lot of interest regarding the state of education in America and how you, the mom, the dad, the teacher, the everyday citizen can make a difference towards improving the quality of education for all children. Now, before we bring our guest on, I have a few items to go over with you. First, Heritage Classical Academy sponsor these events for free so that you, our audience, can receive this information with no cost. Our ultimate goal is to draw enough support for our school that we plan to open in 2023. You can help us open our school simply by liking, retweeting, sharing our posts or our tweets. We are creating a lot of great content, ladies and gentlemen, on classical education. So subscribe because you do not want to miss out on some of these excellent materials. Lastly, at the end of the interview, I do want to make sure, please stay back with us for just a few minutes. I'd like to share with you some upcoming events that you're definitely going to watch. With that, we are ready to begin, so let's do this. With me today, I'm honored to have, uh, to be introducing our YouTube fans to the one and only, the legendary, Dr. Katie O'Toole. Welcome, Dr. O'Toole. Thank you so much for being with us. You do know that you're legendary, right? Oh, thank you, Oscar. That is not necessary. <laughs> nice <laughs> well, to be with you. <laughs> well, we are so honored that you're with us. I mean, you've you've been on uh, you've been on TV, you've been on the radio with uh, big names out there. So we're very very honored that you have uh, you know you're gracing us with your presence. And I oh do my have gosh. To... well, thanks for having me. <laughs> of course, and I do have to say that your colleagues, as well as the headmasters that work with you, they love everything that you do, uh, especially because of your character, your intent. Integrity. So thank you once again for being with us. I've prepared a few questions, Dr. O'Toole, um, for you. But before I begin asking them, I, I want to give our audience a few details about yourself, if that's okay. According, sure. to, uh, according to your Hillsdale profile, you are the first ever assistant provost for the K-12 education. Uh, did I get that correctly? That's right. Yeah. Assistant provost for K-12 at Hillsdale College. And what that means is I, I bring together the college's outreach efforts in K-12. through mm -hmm. um, Hillsdale College is 175 years old, and uh, we've been working in K-12 education for a long time, too, for three decades, a little over three decades. Um, and that work has taken a number of forms. We have a private school here on campus, Hillsdale Academy, which has a long history of sort of inspiring and supporting other private classical schools across the country. And then in 2010, we started something called the Barney Charter School Initiative, through which we help local groups of citizens and local organizations start classical charter schools. So that's a mm -hmm. way to bring classical education into the public schooling realm. Mm -hmm. And um, through this position, which I now hold, I sort of bring all of that together and help help organize our K-12 outreach. Yeah, so underneath the umbrella of the provost office, um, you, you also have BCSI, is that correct? So when I started uh, working with, uh, with Hillsdale, it was under BCSI, so this is a, a whole new different uh, organizational structure. It's, it's, it's not that different, um, but it, mm -hmm. yeah, BCSI is one part of what we do, the Barney Charter School Initiative. We also work with private schools, um, and we also are we're piloting some homeschooling curriculum as well. As you know, the Fantastic. demand for classical education is just skyrocketing, especially in the last couple of years. And we're getting all kinds of interest from from charters um, or people who want to start charters, but elsewhere too. So this this position sort of enables us to provide support to everyone who everyone who wants it everyone who needs it wonderful i do want to talk to you and ask you questions about that but first you were also at headmaster and for our audience who don't uh, 
are not familiar with the title, uh, you were a principal of a school here in Texas. That's right. That's right. In 2014, I started working at Founders Classical Academy of Leander, just north of Austin. Mm -hmm. And with the help of some very talented people, we built a school from the ground up. Um, we started with about 450 kids. And by the time I left, we were at about 700, wow. 700 um, kindergarten through 12th grade. And it was just awesome. It was so fun and so great. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, you know, I think, you know, sometimes you have, you hold a job and you just think this is the perfect job for me. Yes. I loved doing that job. <laughs> well, it looks like the uh, so stars, fun. it looks like the your constellations had a different path for you. So uh, now you're opening many schools. So for our Texas audiences specifically, um, are there any other uh, Hillsdale schools in Texas or are there any at all? Right now, no. Okay. Right now, no. Um, except for you, Oscar. You're Whoa. starting, <laughs> you're working to start, you're working to start our, our Houston school. So, so that so, our audience, I'm very excited about that. Yes, I'm very excited about it as well. So that our audience understands, uh, in relation to how many other schools there are out there, um, none in Texas. How about in other states? And in how many states are you? Um, do you have Hillsdale schools? We are all over the place. So we, if you include every school that we're working with, we're working with 54 schools right now. Wow. They're in 27 states, and we've got an additional 15 that are working on getting founded. Um, we receive applications twice a year, and we've just received 18 applications for 2023 and beyond. That's so there are a lot of, there's a lot of activity. <laughs> um, yes, it, it yeah, sounds like a lot of growth. It's an exciting thing. Yeah, a lot of growth. Do you a hear? A lot of growth, and you know, we... Go ahead, I'm so sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, as we as we evaluate all of those um, as we evaluate all of those applications, we have one question in mind, which is, is this school going to be an excellent classical school? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. our goal is to invest our our resources, which are precious, um, in places where the mission is going to be truly alive. Hillsdale College doesn't accept any money of any type from any of the schools that it works with. All of our services are completely free to the schools. Um, everything that we do is made possible by friends of the college who want to see this mission of bringing excellent classical education to every American kid um, be successful. And so out of, out of respect for them, out of a duty for them, um, we're careful about where we place our in, our resources, and we're we're not interested in expansion for expansion's sake. Mm -hmm. We're interested in putting our putting our resources where they will really make a difference in the lives of these kids. Excellent. Do you hear that, Texas? If you want a Hillsdale school, you should be supporting Heritage Classical Academy. So follow us, subscribe. Don't forget to click on that little bell at the bottom of your screen so that you can uh, come along our journey as we try to get our own charter school, Hillsdale affiliated, authorized by the state of Texas this summer. So more on that here in just a moment. Uh, Dr. O'Toole, you earned your Bachelor's of Politics at the University of Dallas. And I just had to pat myself in the back a little bit because that is also my alma mater. So always, always graduating great people. You is a great place. Yes, yes, uh, Texas is a great place. And you earned your PhD in American government and political philosophy from the Claremont Graduate University. Is that right? That is right, yeah. Wonderful. Now, with such an impressive res resume, why did you choose, so I want to get a little more personal here, why did you choose education? And in particular, why classical education? I want to hear that your passion for this. Oh, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I, I was in California. I got my, I got my PhD from Claremont. Um, and I actually, before I finished my dissertation, I took a job at a at a University of Kentucky. So I moved to the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. And that was my first kind of college professor teaching job. And what I loved about it was the teaching. You know, college professors have teaching to do and they have research to do. And there are, you know, people are interested in different things. There are some professors who just love, love being in the classroom 
And there are others mm -hmm. who will, you know, they'll do their teaching, but what really animates them is, you know, working and writing and, and doing their research. What I learned about myself from that job is I love the teaching side. Um, and I had a, I had, I wasn't there for a very long time, but I had a wide variety of teaching experiences. I had very small three hour evening seminars with like six master's students who were studying public policy. And then I had big classes of like 70 freshmen wow. who were brand new to college and didn't know anything about government or political philosophy. And I preferred the freshmen. I thought they, I thought it was really fun to be the the one who introduced them to these ideas. And mm -hmm. I didn't mind, you know, also helping them with their writing or helping them with learning to be a college student. And so that was the first clue to me that working in K-12 might be fun and might be might be good. <laughs> um, about that time, Founders Classical Academy was getting started and they were looking for a headmaster. And Scott Davis, um, a great man who's now passed, oh. approached me and said, we want you to, you know, we want you to consider this. And so I talked to Scott and um, I had I had not planned on being a school headmaster, but mm -hmm. I really liked the idea. I, I had a great, um, uh, when I was little, I went to a K through eight school that had this great woman, Mrs. Beeks, running it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I would like to be like Mrs. Beeks someday. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I sort of, I sort of wrapped my mind around it and then mm -hmm. plunged in for, you know, what turned out to be just such a wonderful job and a really fun fun professional life. That's beautiful. Um, so it sounds like at a personal level, um, a classical education did a lot in your own life. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't call it classical education when I was growing up or when I was in um, college or graduate school. But, but my experience, especially in college, especially at UD, um, but also as a graduate student was you know, if you're looking for something to build your life around, mm -hmm. something that will last and remain, you know, remain of interest to you and remain something that can guide you for your entire life, then, you know, getting educated and particularly liberally educated mm -hmm. is, is that thing. Um, other things are interesting sort of for a temporary period of time mm -hmm. or they lose their utility and um, and I've always been interested in a bunch of different kinds of things, yes. but it's really, it's really the great books and thinking about them and, um, reading them and rereading them, you know, choosing the kinds of things that, that will stand the test of time and that will, you'll continue to learn from even after you've studied them, um, oh. closely that, you know, that was really that that's, I learned at UD sort of, that's the way that we, that we can have happiness throughout our lives. Mm -hmm. Now you've worked with, as you mentioned earlier, as a head of school with a lot of children, and in particular uh, under the classical education model. And uh, would you be able to tell our audience um, some of the habits that you saw the children developing? Because uh, to me, that really was the selling point for classical. When I got involved, uh, I saw yeah. the kinds of students that we were graduating, the kinds of students that were growing under our care, and it had most, all of it, obviously the teachers exemplified the classical uh, lifestyle. Uh, it had a yeah. lot to do with the classical uh, model or curriculum. Um, do you have any anecdotes or uh, any examples such as those that you could share with us? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think that's a that's a good question because classical education isn't just about the curriculum; it's also mm -hmm. about how you think about yourself as a student, and how you think about your future as a as a human being. And a, mm -hmm. you know, when you send your child to school, you're sending them to a group of people who are going to be examples for that child, either good examples or bad examples, but definitely examples. Mm -hmm. And so it's a big decision. Um, in classical schools, we talk about your character, we talk about your, we talk about the virtues explicitly, because we want to make sure that in addition to being knowledgeable, we're also, um, you know, displaying well roundedness and sort of solid character. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we started at Leander, we had a great group of kids to start with, but a lot of them had completely the wrong idea about what school was about. Mm -hmm. um, 
they thought, some of them thought school is just about mastery hmm. and jumping through a bunch of hoops so that you impress your teachers and get good grades and then you can move <laughs> on as quickly as possible to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with students like that, you know, we want to show them this is this is really serious stuff. It's really deep stuff. Mm -hmm. It's worth considering. And if you think that, you know, you've mastered Moby Dick or Aristotle's mm -hmm. ethics after reading it once, you haven't understood that book. And that's okay. Yes. Um, you have to admit what you don't know. And that's a that's an important part of, you know, becoming a student. I love that you and point with, that out. With oh. other things, yeah. Yes, I love oh, that you point that out. <laughs> um, I love yeah, that you point yeah. that out because um, it it gives our our audience an idea of how the surrounding culture, the community. Um, kind of affects the way that children see education and see their own schooling, which uh, can either undermine what the teachers are trying to do or can support it. I remember in my own life, um, the many times I would protest to my parents, why do I have to go to school? The only good response they could give or the only response they knew to give was, well, you're going to have a great job one day. We want you to right. have uh, material comfort or prosperity. And for a child, you know, between the ages of seven to, I would even say, 18, those aren't very appealing reasons. So um, there seems to be, now the, the positive side is that there seems to be a cultural shift happening in, uh, in America, and our parents are beginning to realize that education has to be more than just that. And I believe you were about to go into that, and I cut you off. Oh, no, no, no. I was, I was just thinking about the habits that, mm. that kids had when we first started. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, one, of, one of the things we noticed is they, they thought that there were two separate worlds. There's the, the student world and the adult world. Mm -hmm. and, and they would do what they were required to do, but they weren't really engaging with their teachers mm -hmm. or with the adults at school. And so a sign of this would be like you'd pass, you'd pass a student in the hallway <laughs> and they wouldn't acknowledge you. And if you acknowledge them, they kind of like, kind of like look away. Like <laughs> I, I'm a kid, like I don't want to talk yeah. to you. And so just very simple stuff, like stopping and saying, hello, my name is Dr. O'Toole. Oh, Let's have man. a handshake. What is your name? You know, at first they were like very surprised about that. But what that did is sort of show them, hey, you know, we're human beings here. We're all engaged in this common enterprise of getting educated and getting you educated. Like, let's, you know, let's go about it in a community kind of way. Not, Absolutely. You know, not I'm giving you the rules and you're doing what I say. Um, so it was, it, it, you know, when we started the school, it was very obvious that we had to build, build a culture, mm -hmm. a culture of learning and a culture of, um, you know, sort of honesty and directness and, you know, really truly pursuing something rather than seeming to pursue it. Yes. And that took time. Mm -hmm. But by the time I had been there for five years, it was just, um, I mean, it, it wasn't perfect. Um, but it was, <laughs> it was just beautiful to see how the students had changed and mm -hmm. what they, what they thought was admirable, what they thought was cool. You know, we look at the, at the high school and we look at the really cool athletic boys, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of a measure of like how the student body is doing. And these boys, when they came, were just, they did not find, they had not found success in school. Mm -hmm. They were, they were, they thought school was silly. They didn't understand the purpose of it. They'd sort of skulk around, you know, grumpy <laughs> about the uniform, looking for excuses to do something else. Mm -hmm. And by the end, you know, they'd started a color guard. They were coming to school looking sharp every day. Yes. They were setting yes. an example for the younger kids and doing, you know, doing their work seriously, mm -hmm. not because they were afraid of a bad grade or afraid of not getting into a good college, but because they're genuinely interested in reading and learning. Absolutely. And so it takes time, but it's a beautiful thing. And you know, makes makes the students happier because they can tell they're being treated by respect, with respect in a classical school. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most powerful things I have witnessed myself is the uh, the power of a school culture, a classical school culture, to really change and shape 
uh, the priorities, the values, um, the affections of a child's heart. You're right. You know, we see a lot of boys and girls coming in young, and, and the things that are important to them at their age are the things that they're listening to, the shows they're watching. Um, this is the child's culture as they're coming in. What's great about the classical model is that uh, in a very subtle without having to browbeat or moralize, the children begin, as you pointed out, begin to adopt these uh, different set of priorities. And they now take pride in looking good every morning, as you pointed out, wearing their ties. Yeah. I, I, I do recall yeah. uh, they love to wear the ties. We would require it only on Wednesdays. And we actually did that as a result of your example, Dr. O'Toole. We, um, do you know where we... that comes from? I don't think I've ever said that, but that comes from Mrs. Beeks. Oh, really? I told you, yeah. <laughs> my case well, school, thank you to Mrs. Beeks. That's lady, wonderful. We had to dress up on Wednesdays. Wow. And we didn't call it formal Wednesday. But when I started my school, I was like, we should do that. And now it's kind of caught on in the Hillsdale School. So you can thank Mrs. Beeks for that one. I thank Mrs. Beeks because we started it <laughs> on a Wednesday. Everyone thought it was a, a burden, a, a cross to bear once a week. Yes. <laughs> but then after a while... Uh, the students began to wear their ties outside of Wednesday, and they just wanted to look great all the time. And the culture began to shift, which is which is lovely. Um, just quickly to our audience real fast, if this is something that appeals to you, uh, then look into the Hillsdale College uh, K-12 American Classical Model, uh, especially Heritage Classical Academy, who uh, plans to come to Houston, Texas in the year 2023. Uh, to stay um, in contact with us or follow us, just go ahead and subscribe to our channel, where we are also in other platforms such as Twitter, you, uh, YouTube, which we are on now, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Now, I want to uh, pivot a little bit here. It is related to the what we were just discussing, which I think is an excellent segue, Dr. O'Toole. I have noticed, and I think you have as well in our audience, uh, is definitely thinking about this, that America seems to be going through a type of educational identity crisis. Like we see homeschool mm. on the rise. So just from 2019 to 2021, uh, the numbers have doubled uh, on the number, the, you know, the number of children home being homeschooled today. School choice reforms are taking place across many different states. And there are other alternative forms of education that are becoming very popular, such as micro schools. All of this indicates to me that Americans um, believe that education is critical, not just for their children, but for the future of this country. Now, an educator <clears throat> from other models will give us an answer to why they think education is important uh, or critical to the future of this country. I'd like to hear from you. What does a, how does a classical leader answer that question? Why is education critical to the future of this country? Well, it's, it's, it's the way that we form the young people, right? <laughs> um, and when you... <laughs> When you look at, when you think about what it means, any any answer that you give to, mm -hmm. that anyone gives to what it means to educate a child reveals something about um, what that person thinks about human nature, first mm -hmm. of all, what what is a person, um, and what does it mean to become an adult? Um, mm -hmm. And there are lots of, there are lots of different ideas about that. It's a big question. It's kind of the question that we ask yeah. as human beings, who, you know, what does it mean to be ourselves fully happy, fully flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, the classical answer to that question is, we think that human nature is a certain thing. Um, yes. there, there are many, many differences, obvious differences and less obvious differences between human beings. But despite those differences, a human being is a certain type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and our, our happiness or our end or our purpose is to some degree written into our nature. There are certain things that are good for us by nature mm -hmm. and certain things that are not good for us by nature. And part of being educated is learning about that, learning about who you are as a human being, what, what is your nature, and then also what particularities are in here in you as an individual. Um, if and I may. a good education, I think a good education would give you 
a curriculum and a and a group mm -hmm. of teachers and a school culture that sort of you know takes takes account of your of your individuality but mm -hmm. also takes account of your human nature and points you in a direction that will lead you toward happiness absolutely and if i may real quickly throw in uh, an image that i um, like to use a lot and i want to explore uh, what your thoughts are on this um, there's a classical image of narcissus who uh, mm -hmm. looks at himself and his reflection um, the whole time and doesn't learn anything else but his own face um, it seems to me that classical education um, maybe is not a reaction to that <clears throat> but it's a response to kind of that solipsism that is very common for humans to engage in and instead is look at all of humanity written large across all of these ages as a, uh, to learn about yourself as opposed to just looking at your reflection uh, do you think that's an accurate uh, image of what we're trying yeah, to do yeah i think that's a i think that's a great image mm -hmm. it reminds me of something frederick douglass said mm -hmm. you know education is he said for education is emancipation it's it's lifting our souls out of ourselves and yes. putting us in contact with something that's higher and bigger than ourselves. And what I think that's true. I think if you if you know if you believe man is the measure of all things or on an individual level, you know, my my personal preferences, my personal um, you know, accidents, my personal particularities are everything about me. And I have to take all of my guidance in life from that. Um, then you lose sight of what's possible if you look beyond yourself mm -hmm. and use the things that are higher than you to, um, and you know, sort of sort of submit yourself to to improvement mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. through you know people who are smarter than you and books and ideas that are challenging to you and bigger to you, then, then paradoxically, you kind of become better because mm -hmm. of that, uh, because of your encounter with these things that, that can shape and form you in the right direction. Yeah. Um, it, go ahead. No, 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 that's all. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm glad you bring up Frederick Douglass. We're going to jump in here uh, real fast. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to jump into uh, American history. I think our audience is going to be very, uh, they're very intrigued by that. Uh, but before I do, I want to discuss a little more about the cultural situation that we find ourselves in. Just recently mm -hmm. in the news, we, uh, we've seen that uh, San Francisco, for example, in the, in the state of California, has recalled three of their Board of Education members. Parents voted them out in a landslide. Uh, before that, we saw in the news, which was also big news, uh, Glenn Youngkin, governor of Virginia, who managed to win the gubernatorial uh, race by campaigning on education. Uh, there's something yeah. about education that seems to have galvanized the American people. Uh, so my question to you is, in your own mind, why are so many American parents dissatisfied with the state of education as it is right now? Well, I, I remember being at Leander in the early days and hosting mm -hmm. these parent information sessions where we talk about, you know, why are we doing Singapore math? Why, yes. are, you know, why does your child's phonics homework look different from yeah. um, your neighbor's child's phonics homework? What's, what's the deal with studying Latin? Why are we doing this? You know, and we'd get, we'd get a, a group of parents come. Sometimes it was a large group, but it was never enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was always dissatisfied yes. with with the parent turnout because I really I wanted them to understand why we're doing everything we're doing in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, well, one, I mean, the pandemic has been terrible on a whole bunch of fronts, but one silver lining of it is that the parents parents across the country got to see when their kids were on Zoom or bringing home packets or whatever they were doing you know, what, what their kids were actually doing in school. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of them, a lot of them thought, oh, this isn't what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, you know, we were very quick as a country to just bar students from mm -hmm. in-person education for an yes. extremely long time. And that's not good for them. <laughs> you know, everyone knows that's not good. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's inconvenient for families, but also kids need structure. They need to be, you know, they need to be making progress. 
And so now that we're starting to go back to school, we're seeing we've got massive literacy gaps, massive math gaps in students who were otherwise doing fine, students who were struggling um, because of a disability or because of something else going yes. on have really been damaged by what we've done in the last two years. Absolutely. And so people's, people's ears have perked up mm -hmm. and they're starting to wonder if the, the educational establishment really has the best interests of students at heart. And even if they do, are they going about education in the right way? Mm -hmm. If you look at the statistics on um, reading success in like, like literacy in, in America, it's really disappointing. And it's shocking to me that it, wow. that we're that it's disappointing. Like we mm -hmm. had a goal um, as a country. We had a goal a few years ago about every every child should be able to read by third grade. Yes, it is appalling to me that that is our goal. <laughs> in a classical <laughs> school, mm -hmm. you they can read in kindergarten. Yes, you know yes, if absolutely. you know what you're doing <laughs> with a phonics program, mm -hmm. and you have a good teacher who's well trained. Yes. And you have a good, you know, vertical alignment between your kindergarten through third grade. Mm -hmm. They're decoding by the second semester of kindergarten in almost every case. They um, are. Even kids with mild dyslexia, you know this. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, the, the answers are out there. Um, and the results that we get in this country with literacy and math, not to mention, you know, middle school and high school yes. um, results, could be a lot stronger if we were just thoughtful about curriculum. It, um, it, it's absolutely true. And, and I don't, yeah. um, one thing that boggles me, and you know that I'm not from this country, I moved here from a different country, but it's, it's, uh, it's a country I love. I love um, the United States of America. Y'all have been very welcoming and warm uh, towards me. You're uh, easy one... to welcome, Oscar. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. O'Toole. <laughs> but one of the things that has always boggled boggled my mind is how little there, um, how little little attention is being given to the connection between that type of emancipation that you were just mentioning uh, when you quoted uh, Frederick Douglass, and the ability to read, the ability to just yeah. pick up a text and read. Yes. Do you, Do you think part of the dissatisfaction that we see our families um, expressing right now? is maybe a concern that um, those principles of liberty, that emancipation of the soul that you're talking about, is no longer being emphasized or taught in school, obviously partly because we are failing at teaching our children to do math and reading, which is very uh, basic, but also because we're not teaching civics anymore. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's right. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, elementary education, of course, begins with what does it mean to go to school? What mm -hmm. does it mean to be a student? And what are the skills you need to have in order to be a student? How to listen, how to how to write, how to read, yeah. basic numeracy and things. And everyone everyone knows those things are foundational. Mm -hmm. you, you can't be successful with higher learning or with life unless you have those basic skills. Mm -hmm. So just beginning from the ground level, we've got to get those right. And in Hillsdale Classical Schools, we do. Um, mm -hmm. we, we know about the curriculum and the teaching that will give every child the literacy and numeracy foundation that they need. Um, on top of that, a classical education is an education in the humanities and the sciences. It's a well-rounded education mm -hmm. that is geared toward helping you through your, through your encounter with all of the various subjects turn into an educated person who has the foundational knowledge necessary for specialization later. Yes. Um, in classical schools, you alluded to this earlier, Oscar, we think that we want to be careful about causing a student to specialize too early. Mm, First of all, they're still developing when they're in middle school and even up until the end of high school. Yes. And second of all, they can't, until you've received you know, this, this foundational, well-rounded education, mm -hmm. you can't really make a good decision about what you want to pursue in college mm. or after graduation or what kind of job you want to have. And so we want to, we want to help students learn that to be an educated person, you want to be a well-rounded person. Um, within the humanities, you know, humanities mm. means literature, it means philosophy, it means a lot of things. Um, I think 
I think the classical education world is kind of known for the humanities. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that a classical school isn't serious about science. Classical schools, um, at least those classical schools, are really serious about science. Yes. Um, you take advanced math and science all the way up until high school, until the end of high school. Um, and we're very careful about helping students remember that you know, it's it's not it's not right to say I'm not a math person or I'm not a literature person. <laughs> You're a person, and so <laughs> you should study mathematics. And you're capable as long as you have good instruction. You're capable of doing mathematics at a high level. Um, so, you know, a, a classical school is not only a humanities school, contrary to what a lot of people think. I'm glad that you jumped um, into this. Um, Real fast, because it's um, yeah. a second, uh, you know, a question I wanted to ask you. There's a lot of misconception about what classical education is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll hear sometimes parents say, um, and teachers say that uh, classical education is really uh, an education on the ideas of dead white old men. It's Anglo-centric. Uh, some people have gone as yeah. far as to say it's racist. Uh, some people say it's only for Christians. <clears throat> so there is an, um, a, a yeah. perception that classical education is for Christians. Um, another misconception or misunderstanding that I hear often is that it is um, a conservative education so that it's politically inclined in one way or the other. Uh, her as, as a team with Heritage Classical Academy, we are producing a lot of good content to address these questions, and we have invited some great people in the Black classical uh, intellectual tradition to address these questions. And I want to encourage our audience to look for that, those uh, materials, those po podcasts and videos, some of them upcoming. But um, have you encountered um, some of these uh, attacks or misunderstandings, and um, how do you address some of them? Yeah, well, the the misunderstandings are are um, they make sense because classical education is kind of a, mm -hmm. a a growing movement, and it seems like it's something new, but it's actually not something new. It's actually the way that um, adults in this or children in this country were educated a couple of generations ago, mm -hmm. um, and so it's not it it's not a, um, particular or innovative or any of those things. It's a lot of it is just common sense, frankly. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's like I think one one misconception about it is that it's elite, mm. that it's you know it's a certain type of education yes. for only you know only the highest achieving students with the highest test scores, mm -hmm. and that's just not true. It's it's geared to our human nature, and we're all human beings, and so classical education is good for everyone, mm -hmm. um, regardless of your background, regardless of your you know, admission scores, remark or, or test scores, um, and regardless of, you know, how much money your parents make. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of the re part of the reason that that misconception exists is that for the last generation or so, classical education has been only available or mostly available in private schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's through the work of these Hillsdale schools and other groups that we're kind of bringing it back into the public realm. Mm -hmm. And that's a really exciting thing because it's made for human beings. It's made yes. for everyone, and there shouldn't be barriers to entry for it. Absolutely. Um, I'm working with many different groups um, that are specifically interested in bringing classical education to minorities. Uh, we strongly believe, I believe, that this is an excellent education and a necessary one uh, for Latino children, for example, for Hispanic children. Right. And, and to see it, um, again, to make it not accessible, uh, to me, is problematic and and. I love that with Hillsdale, we can work to, to make those um, this type of education accessible to everyone. I love the message of the school. Yeah. School. Yeah. If you so when I started my my job here at the college a few mm -hmm. years ago, three years ago now, um, the first thing I did was get on a plane and visit all of the schools in person. Yes. Wow. Because I just had to see them. And so I got a lot of Delta Sky miles out of that. Um, and uh, also Marriott points. <laughs> but anyway, we've seen yeah. <laughs> we've seen we've seen all of the schools now, and they're mm -hmm. in every type of neighborhood that yes. that you can that exists in this country. 
and they serve every type of student that exists in this country. Some mm -hmm. of them are rural, some of them are urban, some of them are suburban. The kids from every background. There are kids uh, who live on the edge of the Navajo reservation, and some yes. of them go home to the reservation at night. There are kids in um, kids in the inner city whose educational options are really very mm -hmm. limited. Um, and they they come to a classical school, and these schools all look different from each other. They reflect the communities that they're in, but in their mm -hmm. principles, in the core, the tenets of their curriculum and the tenets of their of their instruction and the way that they think about education, they're the same. Absolutely. Um, and that I think is a beautiful thing. It's it's very obvious if you're on the ground that this works for every child and it's good for every child. One thing that uh, really stands out to me about the Hillsdale um, classical model is that you guys use the um, the qualifier or, or modifier American classical education. Uh, this is, uh, I don't see it done by any of the other classical schools that I've worked with in the past, uh, the classical schools that I am affiliated with now, and I actually find that very intriguing um, because it, it seems to be addressing or to want to address our current 20th century American life as opposed to, say, some classical models where the focus could be, and I think that um, an argument could be made that the focus is maybe too much on um, the English classics or the focus is too much on the Russian classics, whereas an American classical education seems to want to focus more on the American uh, the classics and the American canon that follows from that. Is that an accurate representation, uh, Dr. O'Toole? A sort of. I mean, I we do read Dostoevsky. We do read, yes. good, um, good. you know, we're, we're not limiting the curriculum to the study of America mm -hmm. in literature or history or anything else. Um, but we, you know, but we do think that we are American citizens yes. and or we're going to be American citizens, you know, if we're receiving this education. Great. And um, that requires certain things of us mm -hmm. and that the the education that we receive <laughs> when we're growing up kindergarten through 12th grade mm -hmm. should help prepare us for that. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that it's an ideological or a politicized education, but it does mean that um, we that if you go to a Hillsdale school, you're going to study American history alongside world history and um, and everything else. But you're you, you know we're gonna we're gonna do our best to make sure that when you graduate from twelfth grade, yeah. you know the history of America, you know the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. the Constitution, you know the history of American political thought. You've received an education in economics, Excellent. and um, and the reason for that is not just functional. The reason for that is that by by studying history, um, not just American history, but all history, you encounter human beings and situations regarding groups of human beings that you would not otherwise understand mm -hmm. merely from your own experience. Mm -hmm. um, and this is very helpful because it gives us insight into human nature. Yes. And as citizens, you know, this is a this is a country where we, the people, have the sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to us, not up to, you know, the king or uh, some other elected official to to determine the direction of the country and to make a judgment about what's yeah. good and what's bad and what should be preserved and what should be changed. And if you have a if you have a deep understanding of history of mm -hmm. america and and in general, then you're a lot wiser. Mm -hmm. about about those judgments than yes. you would be if you were merely you know merely going from the stuff that you've seen in your own life which is yeah really short and really small <laughs> compared to all of history yes this is um leads us to the one question i think a lot of our viewers really want to hear you address and i'm going to try to put uh three or four questions into one because we're running out of time and i don't want to miss out on Wait. this well, i know we have you here this is such a special moment um, and it's the um hillsdale's 1776 curriculum that you guys released past uh this past summer um what does it include dr o'toole why should teachers and schools adopt it and how does it tackle the more controversial and difficult aspects of American history like slavery, the Civil War, 
and race relations. So the microphone is yours. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, as I mentioned, the college has been working in K-12 education for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we ourselves as a college are 175 years old. Mm -hmm. um, the college was founded by abolitionists. If you look at a picture mm -hmm. of the first graduating class of Hillsdale College, there's a black man there. Wow. Um, and at the time, that was a very rare thing. There's also a woman there. Wow. Um, or multiple women, maybe. I have to look at the picture and remind myself. But anyway, mm -hmm. it was it was it was founded to be a college for everyone. Wow. Um, even at the time of the Civil War, founded in 1844. So the Civil War happened soon after the college's foundation. Um, so we've been thinking about history and we've been thinking about American history and the Civil War for a long time here mm -hmm. at Hillsdale. Um, when when these debates about how we should be teaching American history and particularly these moments in American history where race was a question or an issue came mm -hmm. out, we thought, well, we have we have a curriculum mm -hmm. for for teaching, you know, American history in a scholarly and honest way. Let's just make it available to people. Mm. Um, and so we we put it together as the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum. It's partially finished now. We began with the units on the American founding and the Civil War. And um, we took the, the scope and sequence for those things that's in the mm -hmm. program guide for our affiliated schools. And we fleshed it out with the help of master teachers in our network with lesson plans, primary source documents, key terms, mm -hmm. everything that you would need to kind of take these, first of all, the historical questions, but then also these um, these related questions regarding racial justice and mm -hmm. how we should regard um, the, the, the existence of slavery at the time of the American founding mm -hmm. and then the fight over slavery at the time of the Civil War. It, it's everything you need to sort of approach those questions based on the historical evidence, the documentary evidence that we have. So the curriculum's free. Um, all you have to do is go to k12.hillsdale.edu to download it. Oh, let me see and, if I can put um, that up on the screen there. There it goes. k12.hillsdale.edu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's Great. it's free. We've had we've had over 100,000 people download it. Um, wow. We hear from teachers Already. all the time. Thank you, thank you. I was looking for I was looking for lesson plans that I could trust, and this is what I've gotten. Amazing. The curriculum was. Um, it was recently reviewed by the National Association of Scholars. Okay. You know, there are a lot of groups coming out with curricula right now about these, mm -hmm. about American history, mm -hmm. in particular, these issues within American history. Mm -hmm. And the National Association of Scholars said none of them approaches the standard of the Hillsdale curriculum. What it's the gold standard. Wow. That's incredible. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a scholarly resource that teachers can trust. Okay. And um, our goal is, is just to be helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, people are people are grasping around for a way to approach these questions with students yes. um, that's honest and that's fair and that treats them with respect. I, and uh, the curriculum does that. Mm -hmm. I think the best way to address um, concerns, attacks, um, mis misperceptions of the curriculum is what you guys have done, if I understand correctly, which is it is absolutely it's transparent it's free it's on the website anyone can go in and see it for themselves yeah just read it <laughs> yeah that's amazing and yep. uh, it's, there seems to be like a, a, a heavy uh, reliance on primary documents is that correct which is another thing that i find so fascinating yeah that's right i mean mm -hmm. i mean when we're trying to understand so let's think about a specific question thomas jefferson wrote mm -hmm. all men are created equal in yes. the declaration of independence but he also had slaves. Yes. So how are we to understand that? Mm -hmm. um, was he a hypocrite? Was he confused? Um, did he did he not mean it when he said it? How do that's a puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. How are mm -hmm. we to understand that? Well, we could just draw a conclusion quickly right now based on those two pieces of those two facts. But it's better to go read what Thomas Jefferson himself wrote about it mm -hmm. and what other people at the time of the founding wrote about it. Amazing. And the good thing about studying American history is America is relatively young when it mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, in the grand scope of all of history. 
Um, and so we have a lot of the documents still. Amazing. And you can actually read a, a fair amount on, you know, what Thomas Jefferson himself thought about slavery. And the picture becomes more interesting and more complicated. And your answer to how to reconcile those two facts will become um, a lot deeper and also more true to the extent that you read the documentary evidence. So, Dr. So Tool, I, oh, my apologies. Just a quick question oh, about that. Say, Go ahead. Yeah. So, I was going to say, so our job is not to answer the question for you mm -hmm. as educators, but to give you the tools that you need as a teacher or a student or even a homeschooling parent to go Great. through it yourself and figure it out. So this is uh, this is important, and I want just to emphasize it a little bit for our viewers or our listeners. You're saying that this is a conversation that ha that happens and can happen in a classroom at a Hillzo school. It's not that there's an answer to it and boom, uh, the children reach a conclusion, yes. right? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, exactly. let's look at the evidence. Yeah, and I, I think that that's what mm. I mean when I say it's not a politicized or an ideolog ideological education. Um, a classical education asks the question, Wonderful. helps students, and helps students learn how to answer the question truthfully mm. and honestly and in a classical way or in a, in a, um, in a in a thorough way in a thorough and way. so and and that i think is why you know we we're talking about these high school boys who hated school and then learned to love it i think that's why they they come around and start getting interested in school and interested mm -hmm. in really doing their work and and engaging honestly with the teacher and with the curriculum it's because they can tell that it treats them with respect mm -hmm. the, uh, a classical education treats each individual student as someone who deserves to really know. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's each beautiful. individual teacher as someone who someone who should ask the question but not dictate the response to the question. And if you can get that right in a classroom, it's a beautiful and powerful thing. That's phenomenal. I love that. And and I love the the idea of respecting the student. In, not just in the way that we hear it used a little bit superficially, such as, you know, we treat each other well or with kindness, but actually um, the intellectual power of that child, giving yeah. it a chance to explore, to pursue, to ask questions, that to me is a high definition or a much higher bar uh, for uh, if we were to define the word respect. Thank you so much for that, Dr. O'Toole. We're running out of time, so I'm going to just ask you real fast, where can our viewers, our parents, uh, anyone interested, how can they start? What steps to take um, if they want to start a classical school in their area? What do they need to do? Well, um, there's a, we get that question all the time. <laughs> yes. um, there's a lot of information on our mm -hmm. website. So I would begin there, k12, k12.hillsdale.edu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's some information for school founders there. And um, if you're really serious about it mm -hmm. um, and you've, you've got a group together, then reach out to our office, mm -hmm. k12.hillsdale.edu. And we do, um, we do all kinds of advice and webinars and things for groups of local citizens who want to learn about bringing this kind of education to their community. Um, we'll help you along the way, and uh, more information is available if, you, if you're seeking it. Yes, and our viewers can also just go ahead and subscribe, follow us, and um, join us in our journey, Heritage Classical Academy, as we try to get our own charter school, Hillsdale-affiliated school, started or authorized in the state of Texas. Uh, we've also created, Dr. Tool some uh, nice content on the, the five steps, for example, that you should take if you want to open a classical school. There's a podcast that we do regularly on Twitter, on Twitter spaces, and it's become very popular. So if there are any listeners or viewers who would like to just, uh, you know, get to know a little bit more about how to do this, feel free to follow us. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Is that right, Dr. Tool? There's a lot of material already created by Hillsdale that helps support uh, these um, burgeoning little projects happening all over across America. Exactly right. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. So one last question. What other projects is the K-12 education office working on? You mentioned homeschool, and I know that a lot of our viewers are homeschool parents and that they might find that very uh, exciting. Yes. Um, so that's coming soon. Mm -hmm. We, um, you know, I talked earlier about all the interest we have in starting schools. Even if we were to start every single one of those schools, 
that that has applied to work with us, there would be hundreds of thousands, millions wow. of children who aren't close to a classical school. Yes. And parents know this. And so they say, what if I just do it myself? Can mm -hmm. you give me resources and curriculum for that? So we're working on that. Um, we're right. piloting a, a homeschooling version of the K through eight curriculum next academic year. Okay. And uh, anyone who's interested in, in receiving more information about that can go to K-12 at home, k 12 at h o m e dot hillsdale dot edu. That's where all of our homeschooling okay, resources great. live, and future things will be added to that site. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I still have it up on the screen, k12.hillsdale.edu. And Dr. O'Toole, uh, as you mentioned earlier, this is a um, a complete. It's it's a nonprofit essentially, and you don't take any money from the government for it. You, it's all run by donations, so people can support you as well. Is that correct? Do they go to the same website to do that? Yep, that's exactly right. So everything we do is free of charge to the schools we work with, mm -hmm. and Hillsdale College doesn't take any any funding from the federal or state government. Okay. Um, and so everything we do at the college is made possible by friends of the college who believe in our mission. And we'd love your wow. support if you are so moved. Fantastic. To all of our listeners and our viewers, uh, the website is up on the screen. Go ahead. If you uh, have been moved by this conversation and you feel enthused to uh, either start a classical school or support a classical school with your money, uh, it's k12.hillsdale.edu. Dr. O'Toole, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Oscar. We've made it to the end of our interview. I appreciate your patience. I know we had some technical difficulties uh, early on, but uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and I can't wait to the next time. So hopefully we'll have a chance to meet again. Would love that. Thanks, Very Oscar. Good. Thank you. Now, if uh, I can have our viewers and listeners just stay back a little bit, I want to give you some updates. on what you can expect uh, moving forward. First, go ahead and visit our website. You can see it on the bottom of the screen. It's www.heritageclassicalhouston.org. Once again, it's heritageclassicalhouston.org. We are on, a very, on many different social media platforms, uh, such as Twitter, Heritage Ed underscore Texas. We're on uh, Facebook and we are on Instagram. Don't forget to give us a follow and click on that bell so that you receive notifications anytime we go live or anytime we upload a new video. Now coming up, very exciting, we have um, a segment on racism and the classics with Dr. Parham. Dr. Angel Parham is actually on the advisory board to Heritage Classical Academy and uh, she is an intellectual, she's a scholar that very much is uh, interested and has studied the black intellectual tradition within the classical tradition, which is exciting. We're going to have her on Thursday, March 3rd at 1 p.m. and it's going to be another YouTube live stream. Following that, we are going to have with us Dr. Withan, who has just uh, written a book and will be published in March on W.E.B. Du Bois. So once again, within the same series, uh, Racism and the Classics, uh, Dr. Witham is going to be addressing some of the main um, attacks against the classics and how W.E.B. Du Bois answers those in his defense of classical education. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good day.